You're listening to Key Surgical's podcast, Knowledge Unlocked, the show that addresses the unique challenges healthcare professionals face. Each episode explores some of the industry's most complex issues and unlocks practical solutions through thoughtful discussion from differing perspectives. Join us as we provide a space to listen, learn, and help improve the lives of sterile processing, endoscopy, and operating room professionals around the globe. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Knowledge Unlocked podcast. I'm Jamie Zierambinski, sterile processing clinical educator at Key Surgical. And I'm Michelle Lemons, OR clinical educator at Key Surgical. And on today's episode, we will be discussing making great greater, the mental hurdle of continuous improvement. Jamie and I are honored and very excited to have a special guest with us today. This guest is an educator, a career mentor, a self-proclaimed and industry-proven CSS nerd, Sarah B. Cruz. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for taking time to come and talk with us today. Hi. Hello, my fellow CS colleagues. I am so excited to be on the Knowledge Unlocked podcast. I am a little fangirly right now because I've listened to every single one of your episodes since you guys have started. So you guys are doing a great job and it feels very exciting to be a part of this group of CSS nerds. Well, and when we were starting to talk about getting guests on our podcast, which is a good next step in podcasting, right? You know, Michelle and I both talked and you were the first on our list. We were like, we got to get Sarah in. So we're really excited to have you. And I'm a huge fan of yours and everything you're doing for sterile processing and and kind of moving the industry forward. And I just think it's so, so excited to have you guys today and have you here today for our conversation. Will you tell us a little bit about who you are outside of that CSS nerd? Who is Sarah B. Cruz? Oh, yeah. And I think that's such an important aspect to point out because we are people outside of our profession, right? And the people that we are outside of our profession allows us to be the individual that we are at work, right? And how we show up in every other space. So me outside of work, I am Sarah B. Cruz still. I like to play video games. I'm an Aquarius. I love to do the Sunday crossword puzzle in pen. And I am an avid reader. And I have been in sterile processing for over 10 years. I started in animal science, actually. I was a vet tech that assisted an amazing neurologist, and he would perform hemilaminectomy, cervical myelopathies, brain tumor removals on cats and dogs. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I was responsible for making sure that, well, for a lot of things, but I was responsible for making sure his back table was set up using aseptic technique. So I would open all of the instrumentation and very much live that CST lifestyle, dare I say. And I was also responsible for turning over his instruments for the next case. So after I had transitioned into the basement, because yes, sterile processings are also in the basements of veterinary hospitals. (laughs) (laughs) There were no windows. It's a constant trend. I think it's a requirement, but I digress. We got to reverse that trend. (laughs) (laughs) So I would go into the basement and I'd watch the technician work down there. And she happened to be a veterinary technician for the orthopedic veterinarian. So it was a whole gambit. And I just loved it. And I thought it was so interesting. And I realized that I was about to turn 23. And I was going to be taken off of my parents' health insurance. And that was a very real issue for me because I need to have health insurance, as I'm sure like most Americans do, right? And that's when I realized I could no longer be a vet tech. My job did not offer health insurance. And at that time, it wasn't mandated. So I thought, I really like these instruments. Let me learn how to do this. And that's what I called it, this. I didn't know it was called (laughs) sterile processing. I was just like, we're going to do the thing, okay? (laughs) So fast forward, I take the class at my local community college, and I knew by the second or third class, I should have been doing this the entire time. Sterile processing was what's up. Okay. So I was learning all of this information. I was offered a position at a local hospital before I even finished my schooling. um, And I failed my certification test three times. 
Wow. Yeah. Three times. So in my state, it's required that you get certified within two years of hire. And thank God it was two years and not one year because I needed the entire time. (laughs) So (laughs) becoming a CSS nerd has really been cultivated by challenges and a lot of self-assessment, a lot of hard lessons, and a tremendous amount of studying. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and here we are today. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, those tests are not easy. And I think it's okay to be real about that, right? It's it's something that if you fail, it doesn't mean you failed. And we've talked about that on some of our other podcasts. It's it's that drive forward and, and keep working towards your goal. So I'm glad you shared that with us. That's really, that's hard to do sometimes, you know? Yeah, professional investment is vulnerable. And if we're going to get to the nitty gritty about continuous improvements, we have to be ready to take that hard, honest assessment. So I'm for it. Let's go for Mm. it. One of the things I loved that you said when we were setting up even for this episode is you're like, we just see people's kind of like highlights. You know, we see their Instagram instead of that real life. How did you get here? Because when I see, you know, you're very active on LinkedIn and you do speaking and you do podcasts and you do presentations and, you know, your confidence is killer and inspiring and I absolutely love it and I'm super for it. So all the time I will be there cheering for you. (laughs) But I do think, you know, we don't see what happens to come up to that point of getting those opportunities. So another thing thing I would be really interested in knowing, um, you started Pre-Treat CSS and I've heard it and I've seen it and I... I love it. It's always like, I'm super engaged. I really enjoy it. But tell us a little bit more, you know, first about it. What is Pre-Treat CSS? And then kind of along this uh, dialogue, I guess, how did you come up with that? Or what inspired you to start it? Yeah. And so uh, let me tell you where Pre-Treat CSS started from. It was literally just an Instagram account of me posting what I was doing while I was desperately trying to professionally develop in sterile processing. I don't even think I had the sentence in my arsenal because I didn't know what I was doing, but I can articulate it now. So it was pretty much just me posting on Instagram saying, hey, I tried to do a thing today and it didn't go that great. And there were a lot of posts like that. A lot of the beginning posts were, oh, well, I tried this thing. Oh, my gosh. So this one time I showed up to a meeting and I was so excited because there were going to be a bunch of C-suite level executives there because we were opening up a new sterile processing department that they had put a tremendous amount of money in, right? I was so excited. I picked out my power outfit. I did my power stance. I was ready, showed up. No one was there. What? (laughs) Oh, no. Yeah, no one was there because I was two hours late. I had the time wrong. Oh, 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 man, I feel like everything in me sinking. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, no. and so I sat there in that break room, you know, because obviously they had bought refreshments having a cold cup of decaf coffee oh. and like a half eaten, like or a cut bagel. And in my oh. defeat, I was just pretty much just sitting there in my outfit, looking great, not feeling that great. And uh, I went home promptly and took a nap because I had to go back to the site of the of the indiscretion for my second shift. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how pre-treat CSS started. It started okay. with all of the flops and it's transitioned to this formalized LLC to offer a professional development platform designed to assist frustrated, stuck and stagnant frontline technicians to onboard into their career mindset and put the CSS in success. I love that. The CSS in success. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) I I love love it too because it's also a catchphrase. Real life, right? That's real life. You get in a position and you're like, this is it. This is all. This is where I'm stuck. Or you think you have to make some crazy completely full career shift, Mm -hmm. right? So I think that's really powerful. What you're doing is really powerful. Thank you, Michelle. It was really exciting because it was interesting to see professional development on professional development. You know, just watching Pre-Treat CSS go from this sporadic, a lot of action, but not a lot of movement platform to a formalized two-year-old LLC that really helps these frontline technicians feel that representation that you're not alone in your professional development endeavors in the sterile processing profession. And it was something that I so desperately 
wanted help with. And at the time I created it, I had a mentor and he's been more than he's done more than his fair share. We'll simply say that. And I'm so eternally grateful for him. But I had my own lessons to learn along the way that a mentor can't completely assume. So Pretreat CSS really gave me that outlet to see what I was trying and show people that it was okay to one, want to invest in sterile processing as a career. Two, completely be terrible at it at first because you had never done it before. And three, know that I'm out here doing it with you. And if you ever want to grab coffee about that meeting you missed, as long as it's not decaf, I'll for it. And it's not cold. Yeah. Right? Oh, my God. <laughs> Just Insult say. to injury. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Sarah B. Cruz, you're sitting two hours late to a meeting. CSS nerd has started to develop in your brain of, like, I want to start making my own improvements. I want to, you know, kind of get through this mental hurdle of how can I move myself forward? How can I move the industry forward? It's starting to to percolate, right? It's kind of starting to create in your brain. So, tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you see in sterile processing or happening in our profession in general, like healthcare industry in general, and kind of like some of those hurdles or career path opportunities that you've run into that you've turned into this, you know, successful platform or or starting to make that more impact that you want to see in the industry. And how can we kind of move into that conversation today of continuous improvement and and kind of building those those professional goals? Yeah, and that is such a loaded question. I I am so ready to unpack, but it's got to be in two separate segments because (laughs) the industry and the frontline technician, even though the frontline technician is a part of the industry, the solution and our continuous improvements are very separate. And I feel, I believe that the issues we're having in sterile processing are because of the lack of communication between the two and what they directly need from each other, i.e. continuous improvement between the very frontline technician and the personification of them in our industry space. So me personally, as we break down what are some of the hurdles that I've appreciated with a lot of our stuck, frustrated, stagnant frontline technicians in my mentorship meetings is that we deal a lot with Mm, how do you say it's just a job? Yep. Right. It's just a job. But why is it just a job? And that's usually one of the first questions I ask. Why is it just a job to you? If it was really just a job to you, why did you reach out to me through LinkedIn and ask me to help you about this? It's clearly something more because you want to figure out why it's not Mm -hmm. more to you. And a lot of that is uh, represented in this beacon of all knowledge mentality that a lot of our frustrated, stuck, stagnant technicians have, that they are the beacon of all knowledge, that this technician's ego has made me above all reproach. And that's a difficult pill to swallow. And I know I've been told I'm very forward, but I think that that is absolutely important as we discuss major issues that stand in the way or hurdles. These hurdles don't knock down though. When your foot gets caught, like you will literally like right on. Okay. (laughs) Because technician's ego is a huge issue. It's inflated. And sometimes and me personally, it can be so big. You cannot get through the department door. Your technician ego can be the reason why you're not getting a promotion, why you can't get out of your facility to reach different presentations of yourself. Even if you don't want to stay in sterile processing and you want to become a vendor, your ego will limit that ability to do so. So I spend a lot of time discussing uh, how to right-size ourselves through honest assessment and objective-driven goals. And then as we transition to the industry, now the industry also suffers from it's just a job. So see, same problem, different approaches. Yeah. yeah. Now, the industry is very much it's just a job. And I'm not talking about the sterile processing industry. No, the sterile processing industry that I am well acquainted with on LinkedIn, on social media, when people reach out to me is that they are filled with passionate, involved, and committed patient safety professionals. The representation that sterile processing has in the healthcare industry is not personified as such. 
because mm-hmm. so many other professions are trying to speak for sterile processing. Yeah. And who do you think some of those culprits are? Well, I think I don't mean to say it with any type of malicious intent. And I want to make that perfectly clear because for a long time, sterile processing didn't have a relationship with the tone of their own voice, dare I say. So I think that a lot of nursing professions, uh, perioperative professions, and even environmental professions tried to step in and speak. And you can see that with wherever they align sterile processing in your paycheck buckets in your healthcare industries. Sure. So when you have a disjointed representation of what your industry space is, the technicians in it are a product of that environment. They are conditioned mm. by it. They don't know how people are speaking about them because they can't represent themselves because they don't have the soft skills necessary, i.e. technicians, ego, and all the other issues that they aren't addressing in their honest assessment to translate themselves to the way that the industry needs to be represented sure. in that space. And I believe that as sterile processing becomes more and more of a recognized, credible career and not just a job, it's going to be more important for our frontline technicians to articulate their passions, purpose, motivation, core values, uh, vocation, anything that makes them do what they do needs to be articulated. Yeah. And it can't just simply be for patient safety. It has to be more. I think also, you know, kind of that inflated sense of self mm. or sense of understanding. Maybe it's just so interesting in healthcare how you have that in all different realms. Like we hear this all the time about the operating room, right? Oh, they think this or they whatever. Or when you talk to somebody and they say, I've always done it this way. That is my, I will go off. I will go off the edge when people <laughs> say, I've always done it this way. Why? Why have you always, and that's a problem. You know, everything else around you has changed. So let's change it. Let's change that too. So I think you can see that inflated uh, kind of idea of who you are and what you're doing in a lot of departments. And the other thing that's interesting about this is it's just how kind of isolated it seems. Like if I'm looking in from the outside, I might think I know what you're doing. Mm. But then you get some of that collaboration, conversations, cross-training, and you're like, oh, man, I don't actually want to answer this question for anyone. I need someone from sterile processing to come in. So I really I think that's a great, powerful conversation. And kind of as part of this, as you started Pretreat CSS, the way that you're talking about you're able to mentor and have these conversations and see these objective, you know, writing objective goals even, you know, something very specific like that. I got to be fully honest. This is one of my, this is one of the hardest things that anybody ever asks me when they say, what are your goals? What kind of goals do you have this year? I'm like, I just immediately, I'm, I'm like sweating, right? I'm like, oh, I don't know. So when I talk with you, I'm like, w- this seems like it comes really naturally to you. Maybe it does. Hallelujah. Please teach me. Teach me all that you know. <laughs> but otherwise, if it didn't or, you know, even things that you've learned about yourself, even if it does, right? How can you, what are some tools that you can give us for for people who are like, I actually don't know where to start. I don't know how to start writing this goal. What are some of those objective steps that you took and continue to take, right, to create those professional goals for yourself, whether that's learning the soft skills or, you know, advancing, being able to talk to other C-suite professionals, right? All of that. How did you, how did you get this way? How did you get to learn how to do these things? Um... Really hard lessons and a lot of mistakes. (laughs) Say it again. (laughs) Really hard lessons and a lot of mistakes. A lot of big mistakes. (laughs) So um, it never came naturally. And it's not like I came from an area of high organization and functioning functionality. That's not that. Does that really exist? I don't, I think that's Narnia. I don't think that's a real place. (laughs) Did you say Narnia? Narnia. (laughs) It's Narnia. It's through the closet. It's in the wardrobe. It's not there. Yeah, it is. (laughs) But um, honestly, no, I was not born with this gift. I don't think it was an innate talent. And it took a lot of trials and tribulations to figure out how I was going to figure out what I was doing. Cause I was because I was having so much movement and I was putting out a lot of energy, but it wasn't purposeful. So 
it was a lot of action with no return on investment. Um, so I knew the root cause of my frustrations, and it was that. And during this time, that original why I was talking to you guys about was evolving from needing health insurance to something more, you know. And frankly, if it wasn't for my Gantt chart and Allison Sonstily showing me how to use a Gantt chart, I would be freaking lost. So <laughs> what is a Gantt chart? <laughs> Let's dig into that a little bit more. <laughs> yes. So as we move through deciding how we're going to create our next year goals or any goal in general, is it's important to understand that a vision without a goal is just a wish. So you can't make goals without a vision, right? Or you're going to be stuck in this constant action with no return on investment. That's why goal getting is frustrating because they're like little bursts of energy, right? You're like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. But you don't know why you're getting it. So the first important aspect is to take all of those keywords I uh, just mentioned, like profession, purpose, passion, vocation, and core values to create a why statement. You have to know why you're doing something. And even if it's your next year plans, your why doesn't have to be some grandiose thing. And my why was I needed health insurance and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a little bit more grandiose now as I start to move into a space that I feel needs more representation. But the capabilities and caliper of your why is allowed to expand as you are able to mentally and professionally show up in a way that serves your end goal, right? Mm -hmm. So there's naturally one part of those five words, your why, dare I say, that resonates naturally from you, okay? I can tell you right now that Jamie is very mission-driven, okay, just okay. from meeting her. <laughs> when Jamie gives a presentation, she likes to review the notes multiple times, even though she's given the presentation multiple times. Oh my God, are you like spying on me? <laughs> I just, Jamie's I pretend... mouth is open, like, what? <laughs> me? How do you know this? <laughs> because I've seen Jamie prep for a presentation, and I can tell when Jamie gives a presentation that she read that when she went to bed with her morning coffee, before she even had her breakfast, and maybe even 20 minutes before she got on site. So when you're mission driven, and you have that way to say, I'm going to do A, B, C, D, and you make that little check off for you. That's your strongest why attribute. But you need to add the other four in to make a why statement. Because if you try to run all your planning, even if it's about 2022 on just being mission driven, you're going to burn that attribute out. Mm -hmm. So you have to mix in core values to anchor yourself into your mission, add passion add purpose, you know, and, and oh my God, and then definitely add profession. And that's where I like to really send this idea home that it's okay for sterile processing technicians to talk about money. If you are professionally driven, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's very taboo, but all of those five aspects are needed to even before you can even pick out what you're going to do next year, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out why make a why statement for your year. Can I make a checklist? <laughs> With yeah. highlights. Yes. <laughs> Baby's going to highlight all the checks in a different color. <laughs> as long as you don't call it a to-do list, because I, to don't list, I don't do to-do lists. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> so we've created a vision. We've kind of understand a little bit about, you know, how to create robust goals. You know, maybe that goal is small, but we want to create a robust goal. Mm. Um, I'm going to say something to you and I kind of want to just get your reaction to it. My goal after, you know, thinking about it is hope. I hope that something happens. Tell me, tell me how you feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is temptation. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't want to knock hope. I really don't. But with that being said, hope's not a strategy, Jamie. It's not a strategy. Hope is an inspiration. Okay. I love that. Yeah. But let's hear, tell me how to create a good goal then. Sure. So I want to be successful in my goals. So Sarah, we're kicking hope out the door, which is fine for creating a goal. But tell me a little bit about how we actually create a successful goal then. 
Yeah, sure. And hope can hang out. It's just got to sit in the back row. You don't have to ask it to leave. It can totally stay because hope's important <laughs> for, and you know, that initial movement. Hope is a big motivator. And when you are feeling defeated and you don't have that extrinsic motivation, hope is the thing pushing you along, okay? And it's that weight of your own hand on your back to encourage yourself along this process because objective-driven goals can be daunting because we're about to itemize every single thing that you think you need to do to get and achieve your vision. So keep hope. Hope's a great way to get the ball rolling, but it's not going to keep it rolling. Nice. Yeah? Yeah, so, like that. Thank you. And I think what you're looking for is something that you can be tangible with. Hope's not tangible. So let's build out a way to make hope tangible with objective-driven goals. Yeah? So if you have pens and paper at home, you can do this at home. I literally offer this in every single one of my mentor sessions. You're going to take your piece of paper and use your favorite colored pen or marker. Jamie's got hers all laid out in front of her right now. <laughs> Organized. <laughs> right? So you're going to... telling all my secrets, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got your paper in front of you and on the top of it, you're going to write your name and your title. Put all the letters after your name. Go for it. And then put the date you're doing it underneath it. Today's date. I don't encourage you to put an end date on your objective-driven goals. All right, so you got your name and your title and today's date. It's important to put the date that you're starting on so that you can appropriately recognize your greatness. Because the progress we make in objective-driven goals, it can be defeating, especially when you don't believe that you're moving at the pace you'd like or with the integrity that you thought and things just aren't working out the way you thought and hoped for. See, there's hope, right? It's important to touch base on when you started because you can see how far you've come. Love that. Yeah. And now in the top, top right-hand corner, you're going to put your why statement. All right. So uh, if your 2022 goal is to become a department manager, right? Write why you want to be a department manager. It's not enough to just say you want to be a department manager, right? Why? Why is that important to you? And I think people forget that, right? They say they have a goal of what they want to do, but they don't really retrospectively look back and say, why did I want to do this? They just say that because this is like the natural progression or the next step in our goals or our careers that we see everybody else doing. But I think that's really important to write that why. Why am I doing this? Is it something that really deep down inside, if you answer that question truthfully, is it something you really want to do? And it's important to articulate that consistently through the process. And especially for this next part. So now on the left side of your paper, you're going to make an arrow from the bottom of the paper pointing up. It is a one-way arrow. That is a purposeful decision. We do not go backwards. Okay? So now you can say we only go up. That's fine. But even lateral, slow, upward progression is great. You don't have to shoot up like a rocket. All right. As long as you're getting to where you need to go and you're having good habits along the way, that's all that matters. All right. Don't step on anybody to get to the next step. Yeah. So <laughs> then that's when you go backwards, I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's when you and find maybe yourself you need sliding. To, yeah. Right, right. Reassess your why <laughs> statement. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so now at the bottom, I want you to write where you're starting from and be honest. Okay, because you're the only one that's going to read this. Unless you want to share it with me, I can give you feedback on that if that's something you choose. But really, you're the only one. So if you're not being truthful, you're only lying to yourself. And that's the first big step of honest assessment and self-awareness that we talk about when we're doing objective-driven goals. So if you can't even write honestly where you're starting from, you're not ready for this. Pull back. Figure out your why statement. Reinvest in your process. And then all the way at the top, you're going to write your end goal, right? I want to be a manager. Remember, that's not the same as your why statement. Your why statement's why you want to be a manager. 
All right. And now you have this whole arrow in between to fill out. Before you start getting down to the nitty gritty, what is your halfway point? So maybe for the halfway point to becoming a manager, you become a supervisor. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty good halfway point. That's a good milestone. So now what little steps in between your starting point and your halfway point can you create to make tangible ways to gauge your progress, physical indicators of your success. Well, you're probably going to need to get certified. You may need to get more than one certification, and you're probably going to have to be a tech one or a tech two before you're even considered for a supervisor role. So we've just built out three steps there. Certification, second certification, and then leadership position or your tech two title, right? Now you've reached your halfway point. I want you to take a look at how you positioned those three options in your objective timeline. How you place them does not denote how much time it's going to take to achieve those. And remember, we didn't put an end goal on this. Right. What would you say to people? Sorry, if I can just have a quick aside, right? Say that they are, say that it is like an advancement in position. Is there other ways, say that they're certified already, right? Maybe they're a tech two and they're certified. They're trying to create kind of other opportunities for themselves. Where would you tell somebody to look that's outside of like education or schooling? Or maybe, you know, it's financing or they timing because they have children and they're a single parent, you know, kind of all that. Where would you tell, get, tell someone to go for inspiration for some of those other things that you can do to advance your career? Yeah, I love that because the last two spots on our objective-driven goal sheet are resources, and you'll list three to five options, and then support, and that's your three to five option. So now your resources include tangible, you know, hard things that hard aspects you can't change. Like you're going to need money for your certification test. You're going to have to buy books. Um, so you may have to list resources. If you get a supervisor position, it may be at a different facility. So you'll need more gas money, right? Now in your support aspect, this is where you want to build out who is going to show up for you when your hand on your back isn't enough, right? So it's okay if it's not someone in the sterile processing industry, if it's a significant other, that's totally okay. My husband might as well do sterile processing because I don't ever stop talking about it, okay? So he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's definitely on the support list, right? But then I also want to encourage you to try and find individuals that resonate with you inside of our industry. Uh, it's more easily accessible now that we have very prominent sterile processing areas on social media. Um, I personally like LinkedIn just because there are a lot of vocal professionals making themselves available for support, whether it's mentorship, coaching, or sponsoring, and gaining that mentor. It may take a little bit of a more of a finesse or courting that relationship and figuring out who you resonate with might take more support. But until then, underneath your support, you can put LinkedIn. That's totally acceptable because in and itself, in your objective-driven goals, now that you have LinkedIn as your support, one of your objectives may be to make a LinkedIn account, right? Yeah. (laughs) I think that's a good place to start. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then that you've built out your resources and your support, you can build out that second half of your objective-driven timeline. You can build out the second half before you've outlined the support and resources, but it always helps when you have the support and resources listed to build out that second half, because this is where like the heavy hit and work comes in. You're going to have to decide if you need to leave your facility that you love so much, or you have to decide if you're going to put up with that difficult team member one Mm -hmm. more day. Okay. (laughs) So there's a lot of uh, soft skill, interpersonal skills that you're going to need to develop usually in the later half of your objective driven goals where your support will show up for you. Well, you'll you'll need your support to show Mm -hmm. up for you. So. And they'll know your why already because you're going to have to tell them. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) This is why, this is why, this is why to Mm kind of help get that motivation. Yeah. And you should have a why statement and an objective-driven goal plan with your vision before you reach out to someone to support you. 
especially if it's not someone who already knows you, because they can't figure out your why for you. They can tell you what they're doing, but that doesn't serve unless you want to be just like them, which is totally fine too. Go for it. I often find that I admire individuals' objectives more than themselves um, because it's easy for me to identify with individuals on a passion-based why, because I am passion-driven and I am very much uh, professionally driven and with motivation. But passion-driven sees passion-driven. So when you're looking for that support, try to find individuals that don't emulate your strong why. Mm. Okay? So I can admire and aspire to the objectives of these individuals. But when I look for tutelage and support, coaching, sponsorship, mentorship, look for the person who's motivated by vocation. Look for someone whose why is really strong core values. If you don't have that in your why statement or it was difficult for you to develop that because they're going to supplement your weak points. And I hate saying weak points, but, you know, it's professional development for a reason. Mm. And we aren't naturals at just going out and getting the job we've always wanted. Right? (laughs) We have to learn how to do that. So that's what this does. This is what it affords you. I I like when you say that because the other part, you know, we talk about complaining in our industry and, and those are type of things we just get like, so I get so frustrated, right? With complaint. I'm complaining about complaining. So write that down. Doing Inception. great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but talking about l- learning the skills and how to approach these things. So it's not just, yep, I'm going to be the manager and then it's just a matter of time and I have to wait till Susan retires, right? It, it's not like that. It's what are the actionable steps now or complaining, right? What are the actionable steps I can take about this complaint? And I know we kind of have talked about that a little bit and I love everything you say about it, but just kind of in an interest to get to uh, uh, one more topic kind of before <laughs> before we end our time together, which this is not the last time I have so many more questions like pages and pages right jamie has organized them for me yes the highlighters. <laughs> Not of them organized. we'll pitch it we'll pitch it for a series here yeah. Haas, there. why don't you uh just sign up right now Be yeah. exactly <laughs> so as we were kind of preparing for this episode you said something and i'm like man that is just i think that's something that everybody needs to hear you said especially in this last two years right covid has given everybody an opportunity to completely transform or radically transform themselves into someone completely different or something completely different, a very different tech, a very different professional, a completely different operating room nurse who has these different views or whys, right? And what I think is so powerful about you, Sarah, just watching you work and engaging with you, right, and speaking with you and as you are, as I see you around, right? As we kind of function in the same place, I guess. See you it's around. Small world. Totally virtually, but you you know, you got it. It seems to be like something you really believe to your core. And I think that's really powerful, not just in the times of crisis, right? And COVID and where we have this full, everybody's experiencing something at the same time. But I think that's something really powerful for this industry. So, you know, how can you, how do you think that mentality could change, I'm lumping in operating room as well, because a lot of these conversations we're having while we're talking about sterile processing could translate immediately into the operating room and really in the same way, (laughs) actually. So how do you think that that mentality has the opportunity to change our industries or to change our professions? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to make one thing perfectly clear. A mind shift change happens just like that. That's all it takes to change your mind. A moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't owe your past professional presentation any explanation. If you decide you no longer want to be the type of professional that you used to be and you want to show up differently, do it. And if someone asks you why, they don't warrant your explanation unless you think they do. Now. I'm not saying that a mind shift is just that easy to keep in place. 
So that's where the work and the habits and the systems and the objective driven goals and the why, that's where all that work comes in is maintaining that mind shift. Okay. So that aspect is very important. I would never minimize the work it takes to maintain a, I'm going to professionally develop in sterile processing mentality because until you have those habits and systems and objective driven goals in place, it's very easy to fall back into that past presentation of yourself. And why wouldn't you? It's comfortable. It's cozy. It's like a nice little gray sweater that you put on. (laughs) Yeah. Like the ones we wear, the little jumper jackets we wear in the department. I wish they were warmer. But what I'm trying (laughs) to say is that it feels good. It feels safe because you know that. Understand that in your mind shift change, it's going to be uncomfortable. But that space just outside your discomfort, just outside your comfort zone, lean into it. That's where the growth is. That's where the growth is. And that's where the lesson is that you need to teach others. So when we look at the active complaining, I like to call it, you know, we have to break down active complaining, right? And it is a complaint right? And there's two different types of complaint. There's the frontline complaint, and then there's the leadership complaint. I personally experienced the leadership complaint, which really helped me create the objective driven goal planning session, because I sat in a review, I was trying to become a lead. And they said, you know, Sarah, I just need you to do something different. And I said, okay, what does that mean? And they're like, well, you just need to do it different. What is what does that mean? <laughs> Can what you explain that? different? <laughs> right. <laughs> but I didn't have the emotional intelligence to have that afterthought that Jamie so eloquently, you know, explained. Well, can you can you explain different? I didn't have the amen- the emotional fortitude to have that. I immediately got angry. I shut down. It became a them problem. It's not me. I'm amazing. Look at my ego. I immediately shut down and slipped back into that past presentation of myself, right? So I knew that as I created objective-driven goals, I wanted to arm the leadership of our sterile processing profession with the ability to better articulate their needs of their frontline technicians, okay? And in order to do that, we have to try and break down this idea that common sense is an applicable term, (laughs) Is that like hope for you, common sense? <laughs> I got a lot of trigger words, Jane, okay? <laughs> hope and common sense. They're, they're, they do, they're the mabugaboos, all right? So this idea that common sense is just, it's a limiting belief. The term in itself is a limiting belief because that's what was happening in that review. They were saying different because they assumed I understood what that meant because it was common sense to them. I can't blame them for that. Empathy flag flying. I can't Mm -hmm. blame them for that because they've never had to articulate their expectations to an individual because they've never been asked. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it frustrating? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Did I have every right to get upset? Sure, but probably not act the way I did because you know I didn't act appropriately. (laughs) Okay, I already (laughs) talked about how I slipped into that past presentation, right? That's just a nice way of saying that, ooh, it didn't go well, right? So so I wanted to make sure that we help leaders do that. So by breaking down this idea that there's such thing as common sense, you know, you look at the individual and you say what Jamie stated, what does different mean? And they go, you know, usually there's a little bit of attitude behind it, sure. depending on, you know, who you're talking to. And you already know I'm into <laughs> astrology. So depending on their sign, you're going <laughs> to get a different type of response to that. Okay. So they might say, I need you to punch in 15 minutes early. Okay. Okay. That's taking an emotional term like different and quantifying it. I can punch in 15 minutes early. I don't want to, but I'll do it if that's what they need. Okay. <laughs> I would I really wanted to be a lead. Okay. And what else could different mean? It could mean that, well, I need you to take difficult sets even though the easier ones are available. Oh, you just hit me right in the heart. <laughs> right? 
Right? I told you I listened to the podcast. I know where all the soft spots are. <laughs> I see like those I found your holes. sets and I'm like, oh, I'll just grab this little guy here. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, don't get me wrong. I believe in a warm up set. Don't start with a difficult set. Maybe you start with some osteotomes. Okay. But you got to do, you got to do that jam. neuro set. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. It's got to get done. So again, these are just better ways to outline and create clear physical indicators of success for your frontline technicians. And that's how you make an active complaint. Now, when you're talking to the technician about complaining, that just means they think they could do it better. And I know that's very blunt. (laughs) Let's break that down a little bit. When someone is vocalizing an issue or concern, it means that it is genuinely affecting them. Okay. Even if it's just a little bit, which is not our place to decide whether or not how much something bothers someone deserves a quantifier. It doesn't matter. It bothers them. So they're going to speak on it. That means that they want to, even in a little bit, see something different come out of it because they don't want to do it that way anymore, right? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you actually have someone that's speaking up and saying something, you better be listening. <laughs> yes. A quiet department is the worst department. The scary, worst. Scary crickets, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you don't want the only noise to be your cart washer going off or an autoclave aborting because it's going to be a really long day. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so when you have vocal frontline technicians that are quote unquote complaining about a process or about a mentality or about a culture, they're giving you that insight to where they need process improvements or physical indicators of success. Oh, so that's <laughs> the best part. They've literally told you where they need support. All right. And sometimes these instances may be soft skill support. Maybe they don't know how to better vocalize that they're frustrated with a colleague. Maybe they need your help with that. Or maybe they don't know how to better vocalize that the car wash has been broken for three weeks and we keep washing these carts by hand and I'm running out of time because I'm not doing the sets. It's, it's exhausting, right? So what do we do? We get them involved with the solution, all right? We build out objective-driven goals and we essentially make them the point person or the champion. That's not passing the buck onto them. Okay, that's not saying, okay, you have to make the solution. Oh, you said it. So now you got to solve it. No, you have to work with them to create the objective driven goals that you're going to use as the manager or leadership to help them solve the problem that they're expressing. And then you've created buy in, right? So now, you know, if Nance is doing it, well, if Nance is checking her email every day, I can totally check my email every day. No problem. I was hoping you were going to bring Nance into this. I really was. I know. (laughs) Here's a little aside. Just in case my mom ever listens, her name is Nancy. Mom, we are not talking about you. Okay. We are talking about, (laughs) we are just talking about a person Nance, right? (laughs) Poor Nance has been brought up in a couple of our podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) That's a goodie. But it's true. I think, Sarah, the point that just kind of as we're wrapping up here is, you know, in a leadership role, it's tough. It's hard. And you you dance a tight rope or a tight line when you start divvying out these, well, if you say something, you're going to have to be a part of that solution. And I think it's something that I like that you talked about the frontline complaint and the leader complaint. It is a lot more challenging being that leader and making sure that you're facilitating growth in your in in your department and a culture that's positive that when you do say something something actually happens. Knowing that like not every single complaint that comes in or every single thing that's wrong is going to turn into something positive, but that tightrope that you have to dance as a leader, I think it's something that we have to, as technicians, sometimes have a little empathy. And I think it's really easy to say, oh, you know, so-and-so is not listening to us or so-and-so is not actually making any progress or change. But I think it's something, even as we're building out these goals, you know, that's something we can't forget about, who those leaders are and what we can do to help support them too. And so as we wrap up here, I I just want to say, you know, thank you to everyone who's working in sterile processing. Thank you to everyone who is out there fighting the good fight. Sarah B. Cruz, you are you are fighting that good fight. Um, and I just want to kind of see if you have one final thought to kind of wrap up our little chat here. And like I said, you've committed to a series now, so I'm sure there's going to be a lot more of these. But kind of let's kind of tie this up in a nice little bow or package and and, and kind of send off people with a good final thought. 
My parting note is that you are doomed to teach the lesson that you learned the hardest. And I hate to use the word doomed, but it is inevitable. That space I speak on where you are struggling as a professional to develop, the space that you need to lean into to reach that next professional presentation of yourself is where the sterile processing industry and our fellow CS colleagues need you. I want to encourage you to be transparent in your professional development. Share your flops, share your successes, and share how you did it. Share the lesson that you are continuously learning from. Why statements, objective-driven goals, technician ego, gaining mentorship, these are all areas I still, as a professional, struggle with. As I develop, I want to give them to you. Imagine all the issues you face in your professional development, your frustration, your stagnation, why you're stuck, how it can benefit our industry. Because if you're not feeding our industry knowledge pipelines, it will dry up. There will be other professions continuously speaking to us if we don't articulate the tone of our voice amongst the healthcare industry hum. And we are already the heart of the hospital, but you are the pulse. Keep beating. Share your lessons. Lean in. Don't be afraid. Key Surgical and I have your back, and I couldn't be prouder to be a part of your CS adventure. Sarah, thank you so much. You have literally, truly inspired us and offered such incredible device earlier today as over lunch, okay, as I was eating lunch, I saw this meme come across my phone. I'm like, man, this is so pertinent to this conversation. And it was some ad, I don't know, I don't know whose it was, okay? I don't know who quoted, who I'm quoting, but I'm quoting somebody. But they said, (laughs) when you watch someone doing something, right, that looks like how, holy moly, how could they possibly do this? Your immediate is like, oh man, I could never do that, right? It's comparison and competition. But they said, this is not competition. This is someone who's showing you that this can be done, that you can do this, which truly, I mean, I love that, right? And that's how I feel when I'm watching the waves that you're making in this industry and just really honored that you were here to talk with us today. We got your back out there. Sarah B. Cruz has your back. Key Surgical has your back. And we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or comments after today's episode, you can email us directly at podcast at keysurgical.com. You can find us on our website, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and as Sarah mentioned, LinkedIn. We are very active on LinkedIn as well as Sarah B. Cruz. So search for her, find her, link with her. Same with us, Jamie Zarembinski, Michelle Lemons. Just if you're doing a quick search, that's who you look for. And as always, don't forget, Sarah, you ready for this? Yes. Keep Keep educating educating yourself. yourself. Thank you for listening to Key Surgical's podcast, Knowledge Unlocked. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to Knowledge Unlocked wherever you get your podcasts. Please reach out to us with feedback, ideas for episode topics or guests, or just to say hi by emailing podcast at keysurgical.com. Thanks again for listening. And as always, keep educating yourself.